Hi Year 11, today we are going to look at global atmospheric circulation. Now it's one of the more complex issues which you'll come across in your geography studies. Hopefully this video will either provide you with a good opportunity to look at it before your lesson takes place and therefore when you come across it in lesson time it's going to be that little bit easier or it might help you with revision and preparing for the final exam. Now, a couple of things before we get started. Before we look at global atmospheric circulation, one thing to understand is the concept of air pressure. Now, air pressure is the weight of the Earth's atmosphere pressing down on the Earth's surface. We can have high or low air pressure, and they're associated with different weather conditions. Now, anywhere in the world where air is rising, that tends to give us an area of low pressure. You might want to make a note of this, Weather conditions associated with low pressure tend to be very unsettled. You tend to get depressions, a lot of strong winds, and importantly, you get high levels of precipitation. Anywhere on the Earth's surface where you get air falling towards the surface, you get an area of high pressure. Now, high pressure brings very different weather conditions. You often get dry, settled weather, cloudless skies, and they're associated with very little rainfall. OK, so high and low pressure, they bring very different conditions and they're associated with, in the case of low pressure, we get that when air is rising from the Earth's surface up into the atmosphere. High pressure, we get it when air is descending from the atmosphere towards the Earth's surface. Now, we're going to start by looking at the diagram on the screen. Here you can see a simplified diagram of the Earth and then you've got lines of latitude. Now, you should know from key stage three that a line of latitude just simply tells you how far away from the equator you are. Now, the equator is probably the most famous, the most commonly known line of latitude. If you're on the equator, you are at zero degrees. Now, above the equator, we've got the northern hemisphere. And then below the equator, we've got the southern hemisphere. Now, here, just a couple of lines of latitude have been drawn in each hemisphere. So hopefully you can see my mouse clicker. Just to the north of the equator, we can find a line of latitude at 30 degrees north. So you can see there it passes through um, northern Africa. It's passing through the Middle East just there. Here we can see it passing through uh, either northern Mexico or the southern part of the United States and Florida as well. Now, further north, we can see another line of latitude. This one is at 60 degrees north. So you can see that sits just above the UK. And then right at the furthermost part of the Earth, we can see the North Pole. We can't see the line of latitude there, but the North Pole is as far away from the equator you can get. It's at 90 degrees north. Now, the exact, exact same lines of latitude exist in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Now, Global atmospheric circulation is the way that the Earth redistributes heat around the world. Now, most solar energy or most solar insulation arrives at the equator. OK, so this part of the world receives more solar energy than any other. Hence, higher temperatures are often found at the equator. Now, global atmospheric circulation is one of the Earth's ways of redistributing that heat. That's a fancy way of saying that heat is taken from the equator and then it's moved towards the poles. The other way the Earth does that is through ocean currents, but you'll look at that um, in your geography lessons. Now, here we can see on our diagram, the equator is highlighted. That is the part of the Earth where we've got most solar insulation, most solar energy arriving. Now, at the equator, the air is warmed. Now, the air is warmed due to that high amount of energy arriving from the sun. As the air is warmed, it rises up into the atmosphere. Now, the movement is known as thermals. As the air rises up into the atmosphere, you can see on the diagram there, it starts to cool down. As it cools down, it will condense and it forms enormous clouds. Those clouds are known as cumulonimbus clouds. Eventually, they won't be able to hold all of that moisture and they'll deposit it as intense rainfall. 
Now, you tend to find some of the wettest places on Earth are found at the equator, and it's due to this process of a convectional rainfall. Air being warmed at the Earth's surface, rising up into the atmosphere, cooling, condensing, forming clouds, and then that moisture being released as rainfall. It's the reason why, close to the equator, we find the vast majority of the Earth's rainforests. For example, here we can see the equator in Africa. Um, Africa's largest tropical rainforest is the Congo, located in the west of Africa. The largest rainforest in the world is located in South America, and that's the Amazon rainforest. Now, once the air has deposited its moisture, it then moves away from the equator. It moves both northwards and southwards. Now, you can see that on our diagram. The air is quite dry. It's already deposited a lot of that moisture. Now, when the air gets to around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, it tends to cool down and it gives us an area of high pressure. Where the air cools down, it sinks towards the Earth's surface. You can see that on the diagram just there. Now, I mentioned at the start of the video, whenever air is sinking, it gives us an area of high pressure. High pressure is associated with cloudless skies, dry, settled weather, exceptionally low levels of rainfall. Now, those areas around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south are some of the driest locations on the planet. We often find a lot of the Earth's major deserts are located in these places. So again, if you look at the diagram in northern Africa, um, we've got the Sahara Desert. Uh, just to the east of that, we can see the arid environment of the Middle East. Those places are dry because of that dry descending air making its way towards the Earth's surface, creating areas of high pressure. Now, once the air has made its way uh, down to the Earth's surface, it will then move back towards the equator as trade winds. You can see that those trade winds meet at the equator. The area where they meet is known as the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. And then the air will once again be warmed, rise up into the atmosphere, cool, condense, form clouds, um, and then it continues to move around um, that same cell, that cycle. Now, that is our first cell, and it's called the Hadley cell. So in the Hadley cell at the equator, we've got air rising up into the atmosphere, cool, condense, forms clouds, and we get a lot of precipitation. Where the air is rising there, it gives us an area of low pressure, hence our unsettled weather. And then at around 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south, we've got our dry descending air. It gives us areas of high pressure, arid environments, and then the air makes its way back towards the equator as part of the trade winds. Now, that's our first cell, the Hadley cell. It's the exact same cell in both the northern and the southern hemisphere and it's part of the Earth's global atmospheric circulation. Now, there are two further cells which exist in the northern and the southern hemisphere. They're exactly the same as each other. The next one which we come to is the feral cell. Now, here you can see, generally the feral cell, it's located between 30 and 60 degrees in terms of its latitude. Now, at the feral cell, here we can see air has been descending towards the Earth's surface. It gives us our dry locations, our, our locations of high atmospheric pressure. Now that air will then make its way northwards in the northern hemisphere um, or southwards in the southern hemisphere. Now, as the air makes its way towards the poles, it will blow over some of the world's oceans and it will pick up moisture. At around 60 degrees north, or 60 degrees south, if we're in the southern hemisphere, that air which is moving northwards from the feral cell, it will collide with air which is traveling back towards the equator from the polar cell. Now, hopefully you can see that on my diagram, I'm trying to hover over the area where this collision of different air masses has taken place. Generally, it's around 60 degrees. So here we can see this warm air from the feral cell, it's colliding with the colder air from the polar cell. Now, when these two air masses meet, they don't mix. Instead, the warm air is forced to rise up over the colder air. 
And as it rises up into the atmosphere, it'll cool, condense, form clouds, and we get a lot of precipitation. Now, think back to our, our key things we learned about air pressure. As the air is rising, it's going to lead to low atmospheric pressure. Therefore, it's going to give us a lot of unsettled weather and it's going to give us high amounts of rainfall. A lot of the unsettled weather and high levels of precipitation we have here in the UK, it's because we lie at the boundary between these two cells. We lie right on that boundary between warm air traveling northwards, colliding into the cold air from the polar cell traveling southwards. Now, that air we've mentioned, it's going to rise up into the atmosphere, cool, condense, form clouds. We're going to get a lot of precipitation. Some of the air will then move back towards the equator high in the atmosphere, and that will complete our feral cell. Some of the air will continue its way towards the poles. So we can see here, 60 degrees north, we've got our air, it's risen, it's cooled, it's condensed, form clouds, and we've got our precipitation. The air is then making its way as part of the polar cell towards the North Pole. Now at around 90 degrees north in the Northern Hemisphere, or 90 degrees south in the Southern Hemisphere, the air will once again cool and it will sink towards the Earth's surface. Now, because that air has already deposited a lot of its moisture, it's very dry. It's also going to give us an area of very high pressure. Now, those two things combined means that those locations at 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south they're associated with very little precipitation. Fun fact for you lot, um, they lead to the two biggest deserts forming on Earth. The largest desert on Earth is not the Sahara Desert, it's in Antarctica. And that's because of the high atmospheric pressure which is found there. Now, once at the surface, the air can then make its way um, back towards the equator and complete the polar cell. Now, we mentioned earlier there's three cells in the Northern Hemisphere, three cells in the Southern Hemisphere. They are working together in tandem to redistribute that warm air, that heat from the equator and towards the poles. Now, hopefully that's helped you to get a basic understanding of the global atmospheric circulation. There is a worksheet to complete as you watch this video clip. If you need a copy of it, feel free just to um, chat to your geography teacher and I'm sure they'll have a copy for you. Uh, good luck with it. It's one of the more complex things we cover in geography. You might need to watch it a couple of times. Um, once you do, you should have a good understanding of how atmospheric circulation is moving that heat from the equator towards the poles.